Hi, here we go. Um, we're going to kick off this uh, Open EdTech workshop. And uh, I'm having a severe deja vu to last year. Um, uh, how many people he weren't here last year, actually, in the same room at the same event? Okay, about half of us. Those uh, the other half were here, or they didn't hear me. So um, we, it's a very, this is a very open, flexible thing. It's a workshop. And the, the point of the workshop is to, uh, for us to be thinking around open ed tech. Uh, the, I am hoping by the end you'll have a better understanding of, of what it is all about, why I keep talking about this open ed tech brand instead of the Moodle brand. Um, but it is all very related and very connected. And, uh, and also you'll have an understanding of how you can hopefully be part of it um, going forward. Uh, so it won't, won't just be today, it'll be everything afterward. And uh, you'll also have, uh, I, I really, it won't be just one person speaking, we're gonna have all, a lot of us all speaking, so you know, be, be ready to participate here. The, the rough uh, outline uh, that I have for today is, um, I, I will start off with a bit of news. So I'll give you a bit of an update, all the things that have been happening in the past month or years, months and years, um, regarding Open Ed Tech as an association, as an organization. Um, I'll show you uh, all of the places online where things are, and give you a bit of an introduction to where things are and what's happening. I have two main activities after that. The first one, well the big one, is I want us to brainstorm around this concept of an AI assistant, a learning assistant or a life assistant. And that's all, just that one. It's, there are many, many issues around it and we're gonna brainstorm the issues and then we're gonna brainstorm the solutions and try and push our thinking forward around that concept. Hopefully we'll get through a lot of that in the f first half, maybe the second. We've got two halves here. We've got uh, two hours roughly with a break in the middle for lunch. So is it lunch or coffee? A coffee break. Um, so we'll have a little break. I'm sure your brains won't take a break, but you know, bodies can. And uh, then I want to leave a, a decent amount of time at the end for uh, you to present things. So. Anything that's related with open education technology, if you have a project that you think is related, uh, is some open education technology, maybe, maybe you got frustrated because you couldn't do a presentation at the moot, you missed a slot and you just want to quickly show something or tell us about something, I'll probably give everyone like three minutes to five minutes, maybe, make sure it's relevant. Um, but you can come up here and show the group and let's have some sharing of initiatives because I know a lot of you are working on some really cool projects and there just might not have been another place to talk about it yet or, or maybe you just want to highlight something that, that's happening elsewhere. So that'll be really helpful. Come in, other drummer. It's a drummer from another mother. Um, and uh, still, I'm still recovering from the adrenaline of the uh, music jam last night. That was so much fun. Anybody else? Who was at the music jam last night? A few, some of you? That was great. Oh, that really worked. I've been trying to have that thing for years, and uh, that really worked out. So, um, so yeah, that's the kind of structure. So look, if you are thinking of something that you think might be good for this group throughout the first part, and, and you can get it together uh, for towards the end, get that prepared slowly sort of in your mind in the background and, and we'll get to that. So let me, let me start with some news. Um, I mean, does that sound okay? Let's have some feedback here. Is it all right? Yeah? All right, we'll take it as we go. Um, so the first news to say is that Open Ed Tech is now an actual association. Cheers for that. Um, I, I've been banging on about this whole concept for like literally years. I mean, the first meeting we had was in 2019 and we had a lot of people together um, around that. And uh, 
we, we built a lot of the basic concepts and we built some of the relationships and, and then there was a pandemic and a lot of things were on hold. And a lot of us all have full-time jobs or two, so there's not a lot of time to dedicate to it. So it's been creeping along slowly and I've just been trying to push it very slowly over time. Uh, and then we started to create an actual association because it's very key for this whole concept that there is a, an association that is separate from any particular software project. Like Moodle can't do this on its own because it's too associated with the Moodle world, the Moodle product, the Moodle brand. And uh, there's, there would be very justifiable skepticism from people that this is just a Moodle thing. And I, it shouldn't be just a Moodle thing. Um, what we're talking about here is an open world of quality lifelong learning that means lots and lots of organizations should feel some ownership and, and contribution to that. Uh, and if it's led by one particular product, it starts becoming too much that thing. That said, Moodle is an avid supporter of this and will be part of this, along with Big Blue Button and um, many, many other um, software projects and institutions and more. We'll get into that. So we had to create the association. And you know, I thought that wouldn't be very difficult. Uh, I created an association before, the Moodle Users Association. And uh, that's gone for years since. And that didn't take so long to set up, honestly. In Australia, it was pretty easy. However, trying to set up one in Belgium uh, from Australia is a world of hurt. And <laughs> it took a long time. And it was expensive. And there's a lot of lawyers. And there's a lot of to and fro. And um, a lot of uh, paperwork. And anyway, we got there. So the official founders of the Open EdTech Association is uh, Fred and myself, and we are the first directors of the board to get it going. And it has a proper um, uh, rules of association, and it's a completely independent functioning entity. And it should be, and it's not dependent on any persons. If, if uh, as over time people will come in and out of that, it'll run. It, it runs like a proper association. It'll have um, a fully transparent and um, clear agenda. Uh, so that was finally formed only a few months ago in uh, June. I want to say June six or something like that. It's in the news. Right, so uh, what we're looking at right now is the Open Ed Tech site, and that's been developing. It's a WordPress site. Um, you, we're, we've been, uh, we keep working on the messaging and the, uh, the uh, well, the content here. And so you can find out here about the vision. Now it's all obviously, completely it's developing and, and so on. At the moment, the only people who have time to work on these things is uh, myself in my spare time uh, my, and my two children. <laughs> I'm hiring uh, my son, Tommy. You'll see Tommy do Guillermo's around. He's 19 and he's one of the best programmers I know already. Like he's just a full on hacker. He lives on GitHub uh, quite a bit and, and he's just, I mean, he has other interests, he's 19, but uh, he's picking it up very quickly. And it's honestly not something I forced on him, but he just kind of, he's, he's, he gets it. So he, he's good at uh, some things. He's working on our first project, EduBot, and some other things. Uh, and my daughter, uh, Tui Dugiamas, T-U-I. So you'll see her around, and I'm actually paying them both uh, out of my own pocket, pretty much, uh, to, to work on open ed tech. Um, and, uh, and, and help with research and the website and the content. So just when you see all these Doogie Armises around, you know why. <laughs> so we have fun at home, we have a little office, and the three of us have an open ed tech day every week, and we, we, we do this, start pushing along this little project. This isn't sustainable, by the way, this is just to get it going, and I'll explain where we're going uh, forward. Um, so the purpose of open ed tech is very firstly to be a very strong voice for open education technology as a preferred platform 
for education. I mean, imagine if parents putting their kids into a school or a university were thinking, you know what, I, I, I want this institution to be an open ed tech institution, it's an institution that believes in open education technology. Um, as a kind of as a brand, as a concept, as a as a summary of the ideals and the principles around open education technology, and so this is the voice and the brand for that concept to make it easier to talk about. You can say open source, but it's more than open source. It is obviously open source, but it's um, this whole particular framework that we that we're working on together. So we do that through research and curating standards into a blueprint, into a framework. There are many standards in the world. There are open standards, there are non-open standards, but even amongst the, just the open standards, there are lots of conflicting standards, there are lots of proposed standards, there are lots of um, uh, de facto standards. So, you know, like the Moodle course backup is become a sort of de facto standard of an online course backup, but it's not, a, not an approved standard, really. It's just kind of a standard because lots of people use that format. Um, and there are lots and lots of standards bodies that try and certify things and work on things, and there's, we don't, we don't want to always be building standards at Open Ed Tech, or hardly ever. We want to be saying, we like that standard, we like that standard, and here's the, the, that's the curating part. Uh, the second activity is about funding. People need to survive and eat, so we need to pay people to work on things. And uh, so we want to source funding from around the world, and there is, you know, there's money everywhere. It's just a matter of directing it towards these kind of activities. And that's the two major activities. And we actually have an address in, uh, in Belgium if you want to go and visit it, you're welcome to. It's a mailbox. Um, uh, eventually, it will be an office. Uh, so at the moment, um, we have a, a lot of ways to get involved. Let me, let me jump straight to the membership before we go any further. Oh. I'm going to have to, uh, where is it? There we are, view the membership options. So we have these membership options here. And th these are, so you can just become a member for free. We just call it follower level. And that just gives you more access to, to things, uh, edit rights on documents, things like that. Um, if you're just a low-key supporter, it's about 200 euros a year. Um, an associate member is more for organizations who really want to support things. It's 1,000 euros. And a full member, which gives you more voting rights on the board, um, the ability to be elected into board positions, um, is 5,000 euros a year. Now, our plan is to, through this mechanism, to get enough to hire two people to work full-time here. And the first two people to work full-time uh, will be, one will be uh, more focused on the, uh, say, marketing activities, the uh, keeping up websites and articles and doing all the communications and things like that. And the other one will be, more, will be focused on fundraising and project management. So they'll be, They'll be uh, connecting with fundraising opportunities, say Erasmus European projects. They'll probably be based in uh, Brussels or able to go to Brussels quite often. Uh, they're able to do all the schmoozing and um, interacting and, uh, and uh, promoting and, and talking and, and um, you know, someone with uh, real abilities and reputation who can um, do this work. It, I mean, it won't be me. Um, it needs to be someone who's just full-time focused on this. And that person will be responsible to help push the next level of funding, which will be um, you know, working with lar these large organisations and raising more money. And as we develop the blueprint for what we want, some of it will be out there and already exist, 
Some of it will still need to be developed. And so the funding will be pushed towards those development projects to create the missing, the missing gaps. And that's how we work our way towards the framework that exists and is usable. So that's the overall, uh, the overall plan. So we have the, the website. Um, now there is a news, there is news here. This is the main um, news channel. There's lots of ways to follow us. There is also a newsletter to sign up. Um, we are connecting this, this is like the source of truth of news, uh, connecting this to uh, Mastodon. So we have a Mastodon um, account. You see it over here on the right. Uh, just this week, uh, WordPress announced a WordPress Mastodon integration, which is terrific. And the best thing about that is it's a two-way integration. So it uses ActivityPub. The, we don't have to hack it through RSS anymore. It means that WordPress can publish directly to Mastodon, and any replies and activity that happens in Mastodon gets pushed back into WordPress as well as comments on, on blogs. So this is terrific news. It's, we've been waiting for it for a while, and it's just coming out now. So we'll implement that very soon. Is anybody here on Mastodon already? Some hands? Not that many of you. Get onto it. Get off this X BS, uh, and you know, get onto some Mastodon. Mastodon is um, absolutely awesome. I'm loving it. Um, it's like, you don't need to be connected to everything and everyone and all the chaos and all the advertising and all the algorithms and the, all that stuff going on most social media. Uh, Mastodon is a lot more low key and you will develop a smaller community of people who you actually like to listen to. And honestly, you know, you, you don't need to be spending more than an hour a day scrolling through messages, right? You've got a life to live. So, okay, and that, make that hour a quality hour. Right, so you're just actually getting news from sources and people who are interesting, and um, it really does work. So, one of the things we have already is an open ed tech uh, Mastodon server, because Mastodon is a federated, distributed social platform through using ActivityPub. Uh, if you want to get one of the highly coveted uh, addresses on our open ed tech server, you have to be a member. Um, and I think that's fair. Um, it does cost us to run that server, and if it had thousands and thousands of people on it, it would cost us a lot more. Um, so we're just restricting that to members. So there's another reason to become a member. Um, the, and yes, you can keep up through Mastodon, and it's quite an uh, quite efficient way to do it. The, the other thing um, that we have is a matrix server as well. So there's an open ed tech uh, server on matrix and I'll just switch over to a matrix client and you can just see what that looks like. Anybody here on matrix already? I'm saying, oh, that's good. Yeah, I'm seeing like 20, 25 people. Um, you know, matrix is an alternative to or messaging, any other messaging systems, and it's like a really good alternative. It's uh, also distributed, federated, people run their own servers, you have an address, like an email address, and you can talk to anyone else on any other server, just like you can email anyone else on any other server. Um, and our open edtech server has a bunch of rooms. Uh, these are mostly working groups that are, are still in startup phase, not that much activity, but there is the general one at least you should get into. The, the general one is the general discussion. Um, there, is, uh, there is this, you can see here, you probably don't see this one if you're just lobbing in. This, that's been, it's a private one because in there we've been throwing a lot of like, uh, you know, keys to access servers and um, uh, legal stuff. Um, so we have to have some sort of channel for that. Um, you will see in here a EduBot Playground. Uh, EduBot is the first little project from Open EdTech, and it's been uh, how long? About a year now. 
um, it was, uh, yeah, it was at least a year. So um, it's a chat bot that you can talk to and it's using, uh, G it was using GPT-3 and then now it's on GPT-4. But we've, we've built some software that helps make it a better participant in a group chat. And we really want to make it a, a, almost a facilitator. So we're just experimenting with concepts about having an AI member of a chat. And it, it really is uh, already quite useful in my opinion. So some of the things it does, for example, is whenever anybody posts a link, it, it goes off, gets the content of the link, summarizes it and posts it back, which means you're not always leaving the chat. You can just immediately sort of see what the link was about. Um, and that's like a very little feature, right? You can also give it certain personalities. You can give it instructions on how to um, behave. And where we want to go with this in future is make it much more of a facilitator. When you have 50 people in a chat and they don't know each other and they don't know what's going on, um, the bot can say, hey, it's a bit quiet in here. Let's play a game. Let's play a word game and start getting people, you know, an icebreaker, a bit of an icebreaker game, and start getting people active um, and help that sort of facilitation as an automatic feature of a chat room that it just sits there and, and helps chat be more efficient and more useful. So that's kind of exploring the educational possibilities in chat. And so if you want to play with it, you can play with it in the EduBot playground here. Sorry, I've got my font size turned way up so you can read it, so it's a bit sort of cramped here, but you can sort of see a lot of people are playing with the EduBot in there. Um, so that's Matrix. And you know, the beautiful thing is once you have a Matrix account, you can connect to, so we use it at Moodle uh, HQ or as our official chat system. All of our company talks through Matrix. Um, we have, I'm also say connected with, we have the Moodle community there. Um, if you didn't already realize, maybe you missed it somewhere else, but you know, there are uh, community chats for Moodle. And so here's people posting some videos from the, the, the music night last night. Um, and you can see some of the rooms here. Uh, and there is a back channel for this very conference, uh, Moodle Moot Global. So if you're not in there already and you want to find out about, you know, keep in touch with what's happening during this conference, get to this Moodle Moot Global um, chat and I will, I might as well, anybody need to know the, the address? If you get into Matrix and search for Moodle Moot, you'll probably find this. Um, Yes, there's links on our website to the Open EdTech stuff. I just thought I'd show the Moodle Moot stuff along the way. I actually meant to in the keynote and then I forgot. All right. <clears throat> so uh, that's the beauty of, the, of Matrix, though, is that, you know, here I am connecting to the Element community, uh, talking to Element. It's the, here's the Matrix community. I've uh, got stuff with my family, et cetera, et cetera. So it's um, a really, really good uh, messaging system. And I'm, in, I'm going on about it because it's the most open messaging system I could find. And it's a good project. I mean, I'm in contact with the CEO of it and uh, he's doing a great, a good job. Um, he's frustrated by the speed of development as we all are on every project. But you know, it's, it has a few, a few wrinkles, but it's getting better and better quite quickly. It's, it's developing well. Uh, okay. And I think that's, oh no, the last thing I want to show you is that we have a document system. So we're just using Etherpad for our documents now. We were using Google Docs, but you know, that's not very good, is it? So, I mean, it's good, but it's not good. Uh, so, I'll just zoom in here. So this is where we're going to be working today. Um, so it's at docs.openedtech.global, but if you want to go to this QR code, uh, you will get straight into this document. Uh, I did say, we at the moment, it's completely open to the world. We haven't hooked it up to the WordPress membership system yet. Uh, that will be quite soon, and so in a short time, you'll only be able to edit these documents if you're a member. 
but it will be open to the world. So, yep, thank you for that. You can delete that message now. So we're going to make some space further down. Um, everybody in, in uh, Etherpad, if you haven't used it, um, if you click the top there, you can see everybody coming in. So change your own name at the top if you want to whatever you want. It doesn't have to be, you know, whatever you are comfortable with. It's basically anonymous, but uh, it'd be nice to know who you are in, in this room. And uh, you have your own color, and when you edit things, it will show with the color. In the, in the settings, you can, um, you can turn the, the colors uh, on and off. Yep. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, we've got the outline of the document. And uh, what we're going to be doing, and what I'm going to be starting off here, is starting to have a little bit of a, uh, a brainstorm around the AI personal assistant. I'm also going to create headings for the rest of it so you can start putting your things in there as well. So let me get on with that. Well, actually, no, someone else type for me. You've got all, you're all, you can all do this. Can somebody make me a heading uh, under, at the bottom, probably heading level two? Please don't mess up the document, OK? So this is the commons here. Keep it tidy. Um, a, a level heading two for. Uh, uh, presentations, short presentations at the end of the document. And if you have an idea for something you want to present, just please add it there. And if you have a link to something, put the link in the document as well. And we'll, you know, during the next couple of hours, we'll build that up and, and we can work on it. Thank you for that. Look, it's magic. I've already got an AI happening here. Um, and uh, I'll, uh, let me put this in here. Uh, let me just, so uh, I'm going to just tidy that up a bit. Please don't mess that up. Ah. Okay, uh, I want to have a subheading here about problems. And I want to have a subheading about solutions. Actually, no, we'll, we'll stick them under each one. Uh, yeah, we'll do that. Then I'll do that. Great. So, um, no, 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 please don't write anything there yet under problems. We're going we're to talk about this in the room. Uh, <laughs> thank you. So, um, let's, let's have a, we've got some microphones here. Let, let me just lay out the scene. So at my keynote, I was talking about the, I believe, a central part of a future learning system uh, could be and should be and probably will be, just because of the convenience factor, will be an AI assistant that you access on your own device. That will be a major interface to the rest. So it's going to sit on your device. Um, let's just start with that concept. Uh, Rachat, this morning, who I love that presentation, by the way, because the UNESCO framework is quite well thought out, I think, in terms of rolling out stuff, the, the policies and the, the structure of things and the reason for things. I really want to... My keynote from the first day, I actually want to fit those things into that framework better, actually, and use more of the UNESCO language around it. But something she was talking about was uh, an issue with AI assistance is um, how do we target it to the lowest, the people who have the least access to education? Like, not just say, oh, it's for everybody. Oh, yes, but you, know, you do need a $2,000 phone. Right, so there's an issue, right? So issue, well, issue number one I'm going to suggest, I'll just to kick this off, is access to the lowest tier of, um, let's say, learners. So can somebody type that in for me? Um, maybe someone just type that in under problems, please, as a, on as a bullet point. Great, there we go, okay. 
Um, I'll let you fight it out. Uh, has anybody else got any other suggestions around this concept for like a problem? We're just going to have a list of titles and then later on we're going to talk about solutions and brainstorm. But it's like what are problems, what are roadblocks with this concept that you can see? Yes, sir. Uh, let's, can someone run around with a mic? Yep, thanks Tiff. Actually you can probably distribute a few of them to other people, we can get them around faster too. Thank you. As you mentioned in your keynote, data privacy protection. Yes. It's okay. a cornerstone. Data privacy protection. protection yeah. Okay. Someone because we, we can we can we can provide assistance, but we need people to trust the assistant. Yes. Into communication and whatever we put in has to be kept private. Yep. I think that's a valid problem. Anyone disagree? Okay. Anyone did anyone disagree with that? I think it's already solved. No, okay, problem to discuss later. Uh, number three, I think it was you oh. over here. Okay. Uh, oh no, you're over there. Sorry, no, Tiffany, you, you do the running. You, you do okay. the choosing. Tiffany, you have to make yourself look uh, attractive to Tiffany. Just a quick question. Are we looking into technology problems or overall people problems? Anything, okay. yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, limited economic ability, uh, literacy skills, uh, availability to things like electron uh, electricity, should be covered way before Is having an AI personal. I, I think that's what I meant by the yeah. first one. Yes, actually. Okay. Uh, maybe um, maybe someone could add some of those sub points: uh, devices, electricity. What was the other thing? Uh, literacy. literacy. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yes. I, I think. Does that make sense to you that it's kind of related to the first one? That's. I didn't mean the stupidest learners. Uh, I meant the, yeah, when I said lowest, I kind of meant lowest. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yep. Yeah. That's what I had in mind, actually. Yeah, totally. So I, I think that's, that's in one thing there. Um, no, over here, yes. Uh, it's uh, another accessibility issue, but uh, from a different angle. Uh, generative AI is quite good at big languages like English, Spanish, French, and so on. But if someone wants to learn in Icelandic or something, yep. it doesn't have enough data to actually speak the language. So that adds to the accessibility issues, I think. Yeah, very good. Yeah, anybody disagree with that? Don't think so. Uh, so what do we call that? Uh, like um, language ability, language, language support? Yep. Oops, sorry, I really got to turn off this screensaver. Oh, come on, why are you doing that? Thank you. Uh, okay. Make that bigger. And, uh, where was it? Um, sorry, I'm trying to remember how to turn off the, uh, the headings because I want to turn them off. There is a way. Anyone remember? Um, there we go. There we go. Okay, language support. Good one. What's the next one? Yes. Motivation. What? Motivation. We are adults. Motivation. We are very short of time. Oh, yeah. So what are we going to find in this for us to be worth it? Yeah, okay. Anyone disagree with that or want to modify it? No? I think it's a good, yeah, motivation. Let's put motivation up there. Thank you. Wow, it's just coming in real time now. Perfect. Um, uh, oh, we're, uh, right behind. Yes? Yes. Uh, it's, maybe it's just a sub uh, point for the first one, but accessibility for the non-typical, non-neuro or non-body um, typical p people. So if you are blind or disabled, Oh, right. Okay, yep. So, physical disabilities or uh, accessibility to, what's, the, what's a good phrase? Somebody want to suggest one? Um, kind of um, full spectrum accessibility or something? Yeah? All right. Oh, well, there we go. Okay. Yep. Keep that. Inclusion. Yeah. Inclusion. That's good. Yeah. 
All right, good one. Uh, yes. So it kind of goes back to like trust. If the uh, personal AI assistant is targeting like children or kids, like transparency, can the parents see what's going on? And that flips over to as adults, to the trust, do we, can we see what's going on? But uh, best time to learn is when you're younger. Or, yep. So transparency for the, adult, for the parents of the kids. Okay, yep, beautiful. Uh, could I say trust and transparency? Should I combine them? Shall we? Trust and transparency, all right. Someone put that in. Who's doing most of the typing here? Can I have your hand up? Who's, uh, who's, who's, who's scribing? Okay, thank you. Thanks for, <laughs> thank you. Love the way that just happens. Um, thank you, Anna. Um, uh, can someone put, yeah, trust and transparency is the next one. Where, where is it? Oh, right. Oh, yeah, if you could put them in order, actually, uh, so just so we can remember the order. I mean, kind of mentally where unfolding them in a time, I think it'll be easier to keep them in memory if they stay that way in the, in the time order. Um, what is the next one? Yes, okay, please. Uh, it's not a problem, actually, but for uh, an AI uh, assistant system, we should like uh, talk about the mission of the system, its goals, and in which context it's going to be used, because uh, we need to think about the accuracy of the answers given to the users. So is that more about the accuracy and the trust of the behavior or about the, you're saying about the, it should state its mission and goals, is that a solution or is it? Yeah, we should think uh, it's going to be used in which context and can we afford that like ChatGPT is going to say something wrong or not? Okay, so. So for the, we, need, we need to think about that because there are multiple technologies and uh, it depends on the context of use. Yeah, I'm just trying to see if that fits in the first one here or is it a separate, it, we're kind of loading a lot in there on trust. Um, but I, maybe, maybe trust is just one issue. How do we trust it? Yeah. Yeah, okay, maybe it's just one issue. We can discuss all the solutions later. Okay. Uh, someone more in the back, get around Sorry. a bit. Uh, it's, um, so I was thinking about um, ethics. Uh, would it be re um, required for such system to have some kind of ethical behavior so that not every project and every person is supported in doing whatever they want to do? Yes. Uh, you mean... Um, is that ethics in terms of some of these other things, or is it? A I don't. I, I don't see it that way. I, I was thinking more about um, Asimov's um, robotic laws. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So built-in ethics, hard-coded guardrails. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. It, building ethics into the system. I love Isaac Asimov, by the way. He is one of the most fantastic people ever ever uh, to exist. Um, if you think about all the things he, he explored uh, earlier last century, uh, he was already deep in these issues. And um, is anybody watching Foundation on uh, uh, this TV series? Anyone else watching Foundation? It's incredible. This, you know, this guy was thinking about human civilization for the next 12,000 years plus across the galaxy. And one of the things that happens in it, ironically, is that the robots get so powerful that uh, there's a war with humans and humans eventually win at great cost and they actually ban all robots <laughs> from the galaxy. I, I hope we don't get there. Um, so maybe put um, no no robot wars. Um, no, no, don't, I'm joking. But yes, ethics into the system. He had three rules. Uh, does anybody remember the three rules? One was um, don't hurt humans um, through any action or inaction. What was the other two? The, yeah, obey human orders, that's right. 
unless it contradicts the first rule. Yeah. Yep. Um, and you it, and protect yourself. That's right. Yeah. At last. Yeah. Interesting set of ethics. Uh, who's next? Here. Yes. Yeah. Um, I was thinking of provide good quality interactions. Um, no, uh, providing good quality. Mm -hmm. Can you expand on? Like uh, interactions. Uh, uh, when you interact with a machine, a machine machine, and human machine, mm -hmm. or human human. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yep. Let's put that down. I think uh, quality. The the issue is how do we make sure it is a quality interaction? I think. Um, I mean, quality is probably quite easy to define in terms of each person will decide whether they're going to work with this thing or not. If it's low quality, they'll just stop using it. So it has to be really useful and high quality. Simos? Yeah, I think um, listening with the ethics and the mission, the goals, I think identity. Because always when we, to, when we want to collaborate with someone, you know, or or hire someone, you know. We have a process of choosing or discussing, etc. So with this type of AI assistant, we need somehow to define, you know, the characteristics, the identity. The identity, right? yeah, okay. Is that, do you see that as, okay, no, I won't, we'll, just, we'll discuss it later. I think, uh, so what is, yeah, the problem is, uh, what is the out of the box identity? Of the, of the system. If you look at the movie Her, she came straight away with a voice and a personality and a whole thing. Um, that may not have been a good identity for everyone who opens that system. Or was it customized for him? Or does the identity change over time? All good questions we can discuss. But I think, yeah, let's put the, uh, something about identity in there. The, 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 out of the box uh, personality, let's say. Yep. Oh, someone's put it up under trust again. We're, we're cramming a lot of things into trust, but I, you know, everything is trust. Trust. Uh, I saw a quote. Someone said, uh, "Trust is a hundred times information." Like you can get good quality information, but like trust is worth a hundred times good information, um, because if. If someone you trust gives you information, that's how you know it's good. Um, all right, is there any more? Uh, we're going to have a big discussion here. Uh, yes, Alex. Yeah, uh, I think we should um, definitely mention something about uh, the model that we are using, since this is a personal AI assistant. Good, yep. Uh, I mean, I see this as something that we wish, something that can be used as a framework. Yes. For how we want things to, but how it works, and regarding trust and ethics and everything else, it's uh, it's uh, on, uh, it's on the model. Choice of base model. Choice and and should it be model agnostic? I mean, yes. Can I? Yeah. Oh, yeah to say choice of base model, I think that yeah. covers it. Yeah, very good one. I like how we're getting a bit more technical too, because we also do need to talk about some of that stuff. Choice of base model. Uh, I think I'm going to stop soon because we're going to won't have time to get into them. So maybe two more, two more. Who feels I have a big one? Got a big one? Is it big? All right. I guess I think about like critical thinking ability and like soft skills. Um, so okay. if the user, is it dependent on just their critical thinking ability? How is it programmed or reprogrammed, you know, for accessibility? Um, so yeah. is, are we going to have pre-programs? How does somebody choose that? What about their level of competencies? And how are we in really mm. going to go about encouraging that? So critical okay. thinking. So we've summarized that as um, soft skills? Soft skills, or yeah. Soft skills. Not a phrase I usually like, but it is concise. Yeah, I don't either. Um, Emotional intelligence, maybe, perhaps yeah, better. Yeah, yeah. I put EQ. Yeah. Um, can I add one, actually? Uh, proact level of proactivity. How proactive should this be? ChatGPT, Chat if you've used it, is not proactive at all. Zero proactivity. Um, my assistant, Liz, is very proactive. My phone goes, bing, and I'm like, ooh, that's right. <laughs> like, 
uh, let's discuss proactivity. How proactive should it be? How, how adjustable should that be? Um, and that, that's, uh, for me, that's an interesting one because it, it speaks to how autonomous is this thing. Uh, one more somewhere. You've, have, you've already had one. Someone who hasn't had one. Anyone who hasn't had one? I haven't had one. <laughs> okay. All right. This is it. We'll stop here. There's plenty more. We can keep discussing in this document and for years. So, yes, let's start. Okay. So if we think of existing uh, products uh, built on large language models, they all basically exploit the human, all the human content output you know, in okay. the internet and talk to any people working on a creative sector nowadays, they're super concerned about that. So yep. how to prevent this kind of exploitation with these, with these assistants, I think that's a big problem. I think that comes under choice of base model. Because the base model is uh, some technology. There is a technology of the generative AI, and then most of it is about the training data and that you've put into it. Would that be would that be okay with you, or do you think it's separate? More what? Sorry. Oh, so yeah. Yep. Uh, I, I think it's still the base model, but uh, because the base model is literally like this is the training data we've used, but maybe not. You, Alex, you, you look yeah, very I agitated. Okay, all right. Yeah, you Okay, we yeah. Let's let's separate training data in general. We we'll just say what data. The issue is what training data is being used. I think actually, yes, actually, now I'm thinking there's more and more issues actually, because I want it to listen to my conversations 24 hours. You might not want to. Uh, that's uh, also a training data I issue. So yeah, I think we can expand a lot on that. So put training data there. Look, we, we are focusing on the learning aspect, but I, I honestly think, why would you have two? Like, why would you have one for your life and one for your learning when your learning is determined by your life? I mean, that's a logical step I made. I mean, we can, but let's, yeah, maybe there's another one that handles your flight bookings, uh, let's say. But let, let's, yeah, we'll focus on the learning. So imagine the movie Her, and you've got a device like that that you're interacting with all the time, and it's focused on the learning aspect of it for, to start with, yep. Okay, great. Um, all right, look, I, I really want to get into actually uh, talking about these things now. So let's, let's um, I, I think we could all, if you've got a computer and you want to jump in, um, and you have, we can start putting sub bullet points under these, but I think we'll have a discussion in the room as well, starting from the top, and we'll start adding some, We'll flesh it out a bit with some solutions. What can we, what can we see? Um, so, do you want the colours or not? Who, want, who wants colours? I can turn off the colours. Who wants colours? Two people. Who doesn't want colours? More. All right. I'm going to do that. Don't like how that menu disappears when I'm small. There we go. Uh, okay, so how do we make sure this, what, what are some uh, solutions, some ideas, just ideas, they could be sketchy, they can be well thought out, maybe you know examples, how do we get a technology like this to the people who have the least ability or access today? Um, now we've got some ideas already, a minimal offline mode available. I don't think it needs to be minimal. Why can't it be completely offline for a start? If you haven't got internet, why can't it be something you could, a device you could literally just send them? 
You don't need internet for AI. Uh, that is a fact, right? Like I said in my keynote, if you missed it, and I can show you here. Actually, if you want to try it, uh, I'll put the instructions up in this document later. If you get MLC chat, it's called MLC chat. It's an app. And then uh, do a search for, actually, if you look, uh, I do a search for Dr. GPT, all one word. And you open the app, and then you download the Dr. GPT model into the app and then you can run the model on your phone, 100% offline. Uh, sure, well that's the other issue. So, yeah, that was like, the only thing that solves is lack of internet. So yeah, there's other solutions, so let's go. What, what other solutions are there to get this to the, as Zakat said, you know, focusing on the, the people who need it the most? And it's hard, it's hard for us. We are all wealthy. We wouldn't be at this thing if we weren't relatively wealthy. Uh, you know, in the scheme of the world, we are all wealthy here. We are all privileged. And it's hard to think about everyone else, but we need to, right? Well, I can suggest one thing. Um, it's a bit far-fetched. Uh, well, I can think of a couple, but look, here, uh, let me think of the easy one first. What, what about approaching device makers, uh, you know, uh, trying to shame them into getting more devices out there, um, you know, working with the people who make things and try and work out win-wins somehow, get funding towards buying these things and pushing them out there, maybe. I mean... The far-fetched one is building robot factories that build these very, very cheaply, like a open source hardware, and you have robot factories churn churning them out. Uh, I'm, anyone else? Anything else? Yep. Okay, yeah, libraries. Good one, good solution to books. Yeah, libraries. Like that. I think we should add open source. Oh, it's basic, but you know, you shouldn't be paying for any software licenses, certainly, right? And just like internet cafes, open ed tech cafes uh, hosted by AI, so you can learn by living with that. Yeah, okay, so like delegations of people going and bringing, bringing this stuff. Yep. Yep. So is that different from, okay, wait, well, yeah, well, uh, uh, Put that there. There's two more microphones here. If anybody else wants to, you know, grab a microphone and help uh, help Tiffany out here, we can pass them around, just so everybody can hear the comments. So that, yeah, thank you, Alex, for the, uh, about the licensing, um, protecting the licensing as much as we can, enforcing or open source. Yes, uh, custom-made Raspberry Pi devices. Someone's added here. Great. Um, Richard, have you got one? Oh, okay, thank you. Um, uh, yes. Uh, like courses, they are supposed to follow UDL guidelines. I think it's going to be a good idea if the chatbot itself follows UDL guidelines. It follows what, sorry? UDL. Universal uh, UDL. Design, yeah, Universal Design for Learning. Yes, I know, UDL, but uh, does that, how does that apply when you're talking directly with somebody? Uh, yeah, uh, the chatbot is supposed to like uh, send text, answer with text, with videos, with uh, different kind of media, and like that we have Indeed. the different means of representation, and yep. uh, is going to be engaging, so it's going to be uh, respecting UDL guidelines. Does that help the lowest tier of learners? Oh God, here we go. Let me turn this off. Uh, does, is that for this section? Uh, for the solution, yeah. 
for accessibility? For yeah. accessibility, inclusion. Or if we follow UDL guidelines, we are yeah, going okay. to have all the inclusion of that. aspect. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Got it. Okay. So let's Thank add. Good, good design principles. Five minutes to the break. Okay, good. Um, yeah, let's add uh, UDL for, uh, well, let's say UDL inclusion guidelines. Yes. Um, I'll do this later, the next after the break. All right, uh, someone typing that in? Okay, thank you. Um, all right, I'll move on to the next one. We'll quickly go through, oh no, <laughs> trust. Uh, let's start with uh, liter literacy skills, actually. Um, only because trust is a big one. I think we'll come to it after the break. Um, literacy, literacy skills. So a lot of people, and I know some people who would not even be able to know where to start with a voice assistant, maybe. Well, you know, in text, maybe, but if it's talking to them, maybe, maybe that's already a big start. Um, however, it's got to talk to them in their language, in their dialect. Uh, I, I know some people who speak of some very complicated mix of languages at once, you know, maybe three languages and slang all mixed together. Um, I don't know, what are some solutions here? How do we make sure that it works out of the box with anybody, any language, uh, any ability of literacy? Training? Someone saying training? Yep, direct training. They will, yeah, they will be multimodal, I'm sure. Uh, it might be a bit further out to get it on device and match all the other things, but yes, eventually they will be able to, they do now, you can already have AIs that will flash up images and videos and as you go. So yeah, multimodal, yep, put, put multimodal down, I think that's important. I think it would be beneficial if there would be some human peers group so that you always have someone outside of the technological yes. order to interact with first. Right, yep. So community learning centers, that kind of thing. Yep. Which is, uh, I was in Indonesia recently and they have this beautiful lifelong, system, lifelong learning system they've built called Prakaja. Uh, Indonesia is a massive country. It's like 280 million people over like 6,000 islands and they need distance education to work and they have, the government gives everyone credit, money, actual money and there's a website you go to which is a training provider portal and you pick what you want to learn and then your credit is applied and the training provider gets paid and so that all works out in the villages where they're, you know, smoking fish. Like some of the things they need to learn are when you're smoking a fish don't stand in front of the smoke because you're breathing in smoke and you're going to get cancer. So they're like, how do you smoke fish in a more healthy way? That's a literal thing that is a huge problem that needs to be taught. And so they have put community centres that start introducing people to this idea of lifelong learning and how to do things better. Because they'll go, hey, we've always smoked our fish this way. And my granddad lived to a ripe old age of 35. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's pretty good. Um, sorry? Storytelling. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, storytelling. Or maybe, uh, maybe to be broader, ad adapting to local methods of teaching to, boot, to bootstrap them in. Yeah, sorry, or what? Yes. Yep. Yep, so build that into the model. So the model uh, uh, um, evaluates you in a way. Adaptive, adaptive learning for the model. Yep. Yep. 
Yeah, you know when you when you install a new operating system on, uh, you might not know how, on an iPhone, you might be not be an iPhone user, but on iPhones, it starts saying hello to you in lots of languages. So it could boot up and go, start trying to find out about you. Okay, you know, try to, uh, hello, bonjour, uh, and then, you know, help you to uh, connect. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Does, does some of this bleed into the language support? Hello, sorry, what? Does some of this bleed into the language support the next point? Yeah, probably. They're probably all the same thing. And they all probably, in some ways, relate to the training model of the LLM. Yes, because because uh, localizing, uh, story tapping, storytelling, the the language in Indonesia, and, and then the example of of um, Iceland. And I was thinking about some of us from Quebec. How our French is different from yes. Belgian or French, um, from France. Uh, <laughs> that, that, it, that those are all sort of the same level of thing, I think. Yeah, no, uh, good point. There's, um, maybe say, um, link to below. Good. Look, it's uh, break time. I'm not going to uh, go get a coffee, have a, have a, a break, and uh, we are back in how long, Tiffany? Uh, the next one's 15? from 12 to 1. Yeah. Oh, we've got 15 minutes. And we'll see you back here. If you don't need a break, feel free to keep typing stuff in this document. And um, this is really going well, actually. I'm really, really liking where we're going with this. So uh, we have quite strict time limits. And uh, I know the coffee situation is not good, that they just shut off the coffee really quickly. Um, so I'm getting someone to bring some coffees in, maybe, but um, uh, we should also get going. I mean, I really need coffee, because like, well, I think we all do <laughs> a lot of late nights and a few drinks, and a, a bit coffee can quite help. So um, I feel sorry about that. Let's see if we can get some in, but we'll push on. Um, only because this really has to end in, uh, I think we have 40 minutes. So uh, I'll spend another 20 minutes, maybe. No, has anyone added, let's see, let's see what we've got on the presentations. Let's see what we're working with. None, okay. Does anybody think of something they want to show? If not, we'll just keep going with the first bit. Anybody got anything? Apparently not, okay. Well, good. So, I mean, are we? Are you happy with the discussion we're having? Is this good, useful? I mean, I've, this is very, very useful for me because I'm going to give it to an AI and it's going to design the system for us. Uh, okay. Uh, let's deal with trust. I, I really want to look at the trust and I would love us to talk about the training data as well. I mean, I want to talk about everything, but you know, this can, we'll, we'll continue after today. Let's keep going with trust. All right. Um, so how do we increase trust of the system? There is a lot of private data in there. Uh, there is a lot of steerage or steering going on. This thing is literally trying to teach you, right? Uh, imagine, uh, you know, Donald Trump built a system to teach you, for example. Not, not, not a system m most of us would be happy with. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of very bad possibilities and there's a lot of good possibility. How do we trust that this system is good for us and the world. If I can summarize. Um, so someone's written one here, which is uh, constant access to personal data and the possibilities to erase them. Is that a solution? Probably. I mean, I think so. Actually, it probably is. I mean, I, the reason why I wanted to access all my personal data is I wanted to understand everything well and then I can trust better its suggestions because it knows me. Uh, if some random system says you should learn this, it's like, uh, okay, uh, yes. Correct. 
I well, I, uh, yes, that so, was one. So of anyone the would would create their own model. So, like a let's say a university or some organization can download the open source code and. Well, I mean, build. yeah. So good point. Yeah. So yes, uh, let, let's be clear. We're here as open ed tech. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this would be hypothetically the a system that open ed tech would recommend and help to implement, and yeah. it would be we would be saying, yep. Uh, the combined thinking of the association is suggesting this is a system that solves these issues uh, and, and works. Something we could all feel comfortable pushing and recommending and getting out there. So yes, others can make their own AIs and there'll be all sorts of things happening yeah. everywhere, but the Open but, EdTech will be recommending this one. Yeah, but it, and it would be important for the trusts of the system. like if. To if, if Donald Trump could yeah. download the open source code, uh, create his own model, and we will have be a Donald Trump personal learning it, assistant. Yeah, we will be we'll be <laughs> fighting the truth bot, yeah, yeah. Uh, truth social bot. Exactly. Um, so yes, uh, exactly. We're, and we're if trying I trust to make... Donald Trump, then I can use his assistant, uh, I guess. Yeah, I, I hope <laughs> open ed tech becomes a beacon of trust. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, is that clear? Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, here. So Th there's two more microphones, actually, if anybody wants to just pa pass them around. Yep, go on. Yeah. So the trust and accuracy of answers, I think they depend on the technology used. Uh, so yesterday we had a presentation about two types of chatbots, IBM Western Assistant and ChatGPT. So with IBM Watson uh, Assistant, uh, the developer, the chatbot developer, will enter the answers. So will, the, will do what to the answers? Enter. The developer will add the answers to the chatbot. Ah, so they're programmed Yeah, it's answers. programmed. But it, you don't need uh, like uh, coding skills to do that. Anybody can do that. OK. So here, we don't have a problem of accuracy. At the same time, it's going to be interesting if the chatbot is able to generate text answers, but using data or documents or files or whatever we decide to do uh, to use and to add the train to the training. Yeah. So that's also possible. Yes, I, I think we are. I'll say we're more focused on generative AI approaches. Yeah. So it, literally, it is generating answers from With its brain. Yeah, I, I think generative is, is a nice approach, but with our documents or whatever we decide, not really open because uh, I don't know if uh, the answer is not appropriate, let's say, it's going to create a problem. So you're saying the uh, training set should be, or the core curriculum for the, for the bot yeah. is uh, limited and decided. Yeah. And who decides that core curriculum? The community. The community. All of us, yeah. Yeah. Is okay. Well, let's have some note taking here. So, uh, obviously, I think I think training data is very key as well. Yeah, um, I was thinking one key yeah. property for the models we want to recommend is that they are uh, reproducible. So we know how they have been trained, and potentially you could train it again. Yeah. And also traceability. When they say yeah. something, that it's possible to see where they got the information from rather yes. than, and then each person can, you, can decide what data they want to get in or something, but it's important that all of them are traceable, I think. Yeah. Yep. Uh, these are both uh, in Moodle's AI principles, I will I'll add. <laughs> um, can someone else help do the typing? I can't, t I'm, it's hard to type and talk at the same time uh, without coffee. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's all good. So um, I think one of the key aspects for trust is decentralization. Um, because if you have one instance, uh, we all know the example of X, formerly Twitter. Um, if you have just one instance of something, it can be hijacked. So I think um, decentralization should be essential for the system. Even so, saying the system uh, kind of contradicts decentralization, but still. Yeah. So your personal assistant should be truly personal. Yeah, uh, on, I mean, I think we're, we're, 
I, I'm trying to be open with the discussion, but I think it's quite clear that eventually it needs to be on your own hardware. Uh, there's no other way. As soon as it's out there, it's risky, yeah. right? Unless, I mean, there, might, there could be ways to have it on a cloud and still trust it, is there? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So how do we give people trust that the down the download even is safe? Going back on trust, I mean, what are our key performance indicators? Like how is the system judging its own performance, so like what are its indicators, how are we measuring KPIs, what's really important as far as performance goes, like I think we would need to have to develop those so that with anything with building trust, it's yep. consistency. So how do you build trust with humans? It's well, we see patterns. So yes. how can we develop patterns with AI that it can be trusted and I think that that comes with time and being able to actually identify that we're measuring this consistency. Of a result. Let me push back a little bit on that. How do you trust a person? Do you get them to tell you the metrics or do you build the metrics? How do you trust me? Do you want me to tell you how much I'm trustworthy or do you decide that well, in your yeah. own head? That's what I'm saying. Like, So the user, did they develop their own KPIs and they say, this is how I'm going to measure the success of the, of the personal assistant, um, how you would do in real life, correct? And does the actual program have its own internal set of KPIs of how it knows what, like going back to don't get cancer from putting your face in the smoke, right? Well, how does the, the personal assistant know that it's been successful? So how is it measuring its own success and how do we measure its success? Okay, so we're talking feedback mechanisms mm, mm, mm. Uh, on every activity, on every action. So yeah, ways feedback to loops feedback. and KPIs, I would say, for sure. Yeah. We need to measure it. Yeah, okay. That's a good one. Uh, I hope someone's typing, because I, I need a typer. We need a typer. Um, i got my hands full. Um, uh, good I, one, thank you. Yep. Uh, I, who's next? I would like to connect back to the traceability. Because yes. the problem with the many AI systems is this, uh, what you call, black box. Mm. It's some kind of magic that happens and you don't know what and it, a result comes out. Uh, I think the trust issue is um, you want to see what what uh, the results comes from, for what what has the process, what, what is the process that has led up to the answer or the result. Uh, I, I think that the, the, the uh, personal assistant interpret that you showed uh, uh, at your keynote, the, it, it was pretty good at show, showing what, what, we, what it was doing. doing so yes. I think that that's a way to go to, to build trust for an AI system. Yeah, okay. Yeah, true. That's while it's working, it's showing its steps, step by step. That step-by-step -step thing improves accuracy as well. Um, that's the chain of thought techniques and tree of thought techniques and, um, and then the ones that even build on that. Yeah, so breaking problems down into small, concrete little things. But I mean, you're talking with it, right? So it, if it's over explaining everything all the time, it's gonna get very exhausting. <laughs> Um, maybe that should be a, uh, an optional feature. I think actually ChatGPT itself already does this because it has its own interpreter. Like open interpreter is similar to something ChatGPT has, which used to be called code interpreter and now they've changed it to something else. Anyone remember the new name? Anyway, when you switch, it's a switch in the settings and it will show it's working, but it hides it under a little, a little arrow. I just show it. I have something to say, Martin. Uh, yep. I think we should uh, clarify uh, what we mean by trust, what we are trusting. In my opinion, we are trusting the uh, LLM model. Because, and, and if uh, Open Ad Tech uh, assumes some kind of responsibility, then you assume the responsibility of suggesting a, 
an LLM, or I mean, you're not supposed to to train one LLM from scratch. Yeah, I, th I think I think that makes sense that yeah. we would recommend an LLM as the base, uh, and it would be there by default. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Be because then, then we would certify it, yeah. certify an LLM, LLM. And, and then you have to not choose a Donald Trump or, for that matter, Karl Marx LLM. Yes. Right. Uh, and uh, then you have the training data. For me, the training data, if, if, since we are talking about a personal assistant, then the personal part of, of this comes from the training data. And the training data, this is, in my opinion, what needs to be, what, what's personal and needs to be protected, like, a lot. Because I should be able to keep my training data in case I want to change or you suggest another LLM, for example. Yes, I think that's, it's always going to be part of the solution because the way neural nets work is they're, they're not ever looking up information. Right? It's not a look up. It's statistically putting words together. And just like we, like I might be doing my absolute best to be accurate and trustworthy and I'm going to misspeak and I'm going to make errors and you, we all are. Like that's just how life is. We make errors. We're not... So we're not untrustworthy in a sense of uh, we want to be, we just are, because that's how brains work. They're a bit random sometimes, and they, remember, they forget, and they mix things up, and they have misunderstandings, and you know, there's a lot of gray. Um, I think that's always going to be there in an LLM, but the, the way of uh, mitigating or preventing that is to have checks and reviews and feedback and that's how we solve things in our organizations too, right? We have teams, we have processes, we have management, we have reviews, and that's how we fix the problems. So, but I think in the future, maybe a lot of that will be built into the LLM. Like it's, so it will be quite trustworthy. So you probably, maybe you're right. Uh, maybe it's just, um, so look, I got a bit off the track there. So uh, that was about, some, can we put something in there? About, oh yeah, we got it, certify LLM. Yeah, someone's putting that. Okay, great. Um, the traceability, I just want to get back to that actually because it's one thing to say step by step during the process of interacting, but what if you get a result and you want to go back and ask it to derive, go backwards derive things? Um, so, uh, I can only think of stupid examples. I haven't had enough coffee. But if I ask you uh, to draw a, a schnauzer, right, a type of dog, and I ask you to draw one, right, you'll have a go. You've probably seen a schnauzer before, maybe not recently. You probably can't quite remember what a schnauzer looks like. And you'll have a go, and I'll go, and maybe you, you give it floppy ears, maybe it has pointy ears. Does anybody know? Pointy or floppy ears? I don't know. Right? What, what are ears of a schnauzer like? So um, you're going to draw a picture and it's, an, it's got an error in it. And I'm going, how did, why did you say pointy ears? And you, you are now trying to think back to all your experiences and like your learning, how you got that impression. It's that, right? We want the AI to be able to do that really well and go, well, it, I know it has pointy ears because blah, 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 blah. And we have to, then, then we can trust it. It's probably going to have to look up things, I, I think. Is the AI going to have to be able to use the internet? The internet, of course, is going to become a cesspool of misinformation which it already is, and it's getting worse and worse. A little side project I will never do, but I dream of doing, is having an AI uh, look at Wikipedia, get all the names of the articles, and make a new site called My Wikipedia, where I just get an AI to write all the articles again based on the title <laughs> and put it online. No, I will never do that. But Anybody could do that, right? And that would just start getting in the search results and you'd go, you'd come up and it might be third on the list and it would be, yeah, here's a really good article about everything. And it would be like 90% correct. Um, and 
How will our kids know the difference? They won't know. So, yeah, there's uh, trust. It comes back to the stuff we put into it. How... Because, um, mm -hmm. Yep, sorry, can you start again? Yeah, because uh, it's not only that if we can trust the, the source of information, it's also the fact of the Gen AI, the, the system is choosing what's the right answer and the level of depth of knowledge in that answer. So are we going to stick on a very superficial surface level of knowledge? Because when we look up something in the Wikipedia, we just go for the first answer we get. And sometimes we investigate more, sometimes we don't. So the system is going to be uh, fed by this recent search and this recent training and this recent answers and it's going to be just going more and more superficial because there's no one investigating. Yep. So are we going to be able to trust what the answers? Is this going to be all the knowledge? Is there anything, uh, I don't know how to say it, but is there anything when I ask this question, uh, anything that I should know? That it's not going to be said in this first uh, in this first answer I'm receiving. Is there anything if I have this critical uh, thinking that someone was mentioning before? Is there anything I should be aware of mm. that as is not being answered before is going to end being forgotten? Yeah, very good questions. What you, you were really triggering uh, my neural net here. I was thinking, what about this model? To, to solve that, what if the onboard AI doesn't have a lot of detailed information? Because it can't, right? It's not going to have the whole internet in here. But uh, if, it, if we focus on the thing that's here being like your super nerdy critical friend who has a good general knowledge that we define in the base model, a general knowledge for easy stuff, is very good at um, knowing where everything is and can do lookups. And Open EdTech also creates, we have an OER group, the Open Education Resources Database of knowledge that we approve, we, we trust through processes, we debate, sort of like Wikipedia, but but serious, yeah, like really, yeah, focused on, on curriculum almost, uh, like the, the, the key things that we, the basic education stuff that we're trying to get up a level of education, like the core curriculum, uh, is what we're working on at MoodleNet, actually, is this kind of idea of quality in the OER. And if that's kind of the ongoing resource that our onboard bot can say, Look, I don't know enough about that, but I know where to look, and I'm going to the Open EdTech database, and that's what this says. Does that make sense, to split the responsibilities a bit? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, there you have it. Yes. Do you want to know more? Let's go to some serious resources you can consult, and we will direct you there. Yeah. Because we want this to be serious and reliable. I mean, so when you say, I've been using this system, someone is going to think, okay, the answer is reliable. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That seems like it makes sense to me. And, and, you, and then you could say, in terms of traceability, uh, you could ask and say, who decided that on over there? And you go, well, a hundred scientists with climate change credentials uh, stamped it, and it's pretty, pretty likely, right? So that's where all the data and the ongoing improvement happens. And you don't need to update this every day because you can't. Um, it's gigabytes, uh, but it can reach out. That, that does mean you need internet, but I mean, that's not too unreasonable to need internet, I think, <laughs> um, all the time. But yeah. Um, OK, I'll, someone jot uh, that down. I quite like that. Actually, that's a uh, I light have bulb. Uh, Who's got it? Sorry. 
Over here, yeah. yes. Oh, yeah. I have a question about uh, the fact that uh, generally uh, the system uh, not always have the uh, availability of internet data. Maybe we can introduce some uh, knowledge, uh, a knowledge, for example, logic-based uh, knowledge for to say, uh, to control. For example, a programmer can say, uh, I already know that uh, uh, this kind of answer uh, maybe is not good, so uh, me, as a programmer, uh, if I have the right knowledge, I can introduce some rules to control this, uh, this kind of, uh, of answers. Also, by introducing some constraint, for example, should be not possible that, uh, uh, for example, the answer, uh, I make a stupid example, the answer uh, should be without, uh, uh, I, I can say, if I expect the Italian language, should, should not be give me back the English language. I mean, some control that the programmer can introduce uh, uh, in some way, some kind of algorithm or rules, logic-based rules, uh, so something like this. You're, yeah, just, so I'm trying to understand, actually. So the logic, you're saying we add more, uh, like, hard logic programming. Logic programming, So that yes. it's a more assurance of yes. certain things for some parts yes, of it. By showing it's not all generative, not, there's not some core of logical... Illogical uh, artificial intelligence, symbolic artificial intelligence, not uh, machine learning or... Uh, yeah, uh, just a bit old so. school AI, a bit of that in there yeah. as well, yeah. Yeah, no, because we are working in this kind of artificial intelligence, uh, our company also. So okay, yeah, yeah. So we can... Uh, oh, can someone put that down, yeah. It's like, uh, yeah, think about mixing AI models yes. to yeah. get more trust. Exactly. Yes. Uh, mixing different kinds. Yes. Okay, that's a good point. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, every time I say anything, just imagine I'm saying thank you after it because, uh, like, I, I thank you all the time, but I, I, I'm told that I forget to say thank you a lot, and it's just because I'm thinking about the next thing already. Sorry. <laughs> um, yes. Um, I don't want to open a box of Pandora's, but I'm just thinking about if we want to approach the lowest uh, tier and we are thinking of trust, we need to think of trusting the other users. Because if somebody uses our assistant to build up a nuclear bomb or uh, makes a library of child abuse porn, we will lose people we want to, to reach with that. So we need to build a, a protection shield. Yeah, you're right. I mean, the more we're talking, the more I'm thinking about limiting, limiting this AI actually, rather than making it too capable, like to, to get to achieve some of these, solve some of these problems, it should be very, um, a bit like the, the one on the MLC, Dr. G, the Dr. GPT chat I pointed out, it cannot write poetry very well, and, but it does know how to do medical diagnosis very well. And it's very possible to have a very special purpose. So, I mean, I, I, it, that limits those damage, right? You won't be able to generate child porn with it because it just doesn't even have that in its tra training set. It's not able to. Um, so that makes it safer. So safety is part of trust. Yeah, you're right, you're right. I mean, if, you, if a kid gets this thing because their parents go, oh yeah, open EdTech, great, here, take the AI and then they start doing crazy crap with it, like it's not, no one's gonna trust it. So you're right, it needs, uh, it needs some safety. But if you, you can overdo safety too, like if you look at Llama, uh, they overdid the safety, and you would ask it questions like, um, uh, you know, are there more men in the world or women, statistically? And it would go, I can't answer that because it is a, uh, it's a, um, it's a, it's a, way, a, a gender issue or something. Like it misinterpreted what the question was about as being, you know, some sort of, you know, hitting a guideline, a, guard, a guardrail. So yeah, the training data. So we've got 13 minutes, I believe. Have we? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I was. Do we, are we, are we keep going on trust? Hands up to keep going on trust or to move to another issue? Uh, hands up for trust. Keep going. One. Oh, you got a question on the boil. All right, we'll do yours. And yours. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. Trust board. Ooh. Did you say trust board? Yes. Oh, nice. 
trust committee in open ed tech. Yeah, okay. Yes, actually, yes. Uh, that's, uh, that's actually what a lot of organisations end up with, so good idea. Um, we'll have yours and then we'll move on to the other one I said then. So, yeah. Well, I, I'm not sure if it's trust or uh, information and uh, uh, training data, perhaps. But I was thinking of the more I was, the more I was thinking about what you said. If it's uh, if it should uh, connect to the internet and the nightmare that <laughs> it's becoming uh, to know what is true or not. Um, Perhaps it's a performance issue, but uh, the AI has a better opportunity than us humans to take a lot of data and make a comparison between the data. And along with the traceability and uh, openness of how it works, it would be possible to present uh, like, like we're talking about with critical thinking to present an answer that isn't a straight up simple answer, yes. but a comparison of different sources like that... Like a little, uh, doing a meta research of some yeah, sort. Yeah, kind of. A meta study. Uh, yeah, I've, yeah, I haven't uh, thought it through. 100%, but no, uh, it's something uh, uh, comparison wise. I think you're right. I, uh, I think that could be, it doesn't need to be on the device here, but it could be in that if there's an open ed tech approved data set of OER, maybe there's, there's, well, there will be AI bots crawling all over that, helping, checking, reviewing, uh, comparing, uh, and using tools to verify, etc. That's what we're doing at, at MoodleNet. In MoodleNet 4, we're starting, because of the quality aspect, the first things we're doing are using AI to um, uh, fill out the metadata. So it's going to analyze something coming in and fill in the metadata fields for you, uh, summarize, make thumbnails, um, extract, uh, work out which uh, learning outcomes it fits, and present it to you on the next form. The next form will be go, here's what we think the metadata is. Do you want to change it, tweak it? You can review it, and then you save it. Um, and then we're also using AI to uh, start uh, helping with the recommend recommendation of what's popular, what's 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 good, what's bad, etc. And like it's just starting, but I, I think it, that that then you can have very big systems with a lot of training and a lot of reviews and a lot of repeating and a lot of feedback, and and they can be in a, in a central trusted place somewhere, existing on an open ed tech cloud that nobody controls. So, I mean, Open Ed Tech would set the, the standards, but then it's got to be a collaborative, collaboratively supported place. So it's always funded. It exists forever. Like, unlike Wikipedia, Wikipedia runs servers, and then they ask us every year to send some dollars to pay for those servers. It turns out they get a lot more than they need, so they actually have hundreds of millions of dollars extra, which they don't mention, but anyway. Um, uh, but that model is kind of relying on donations and it's a little sketchy, right? But I think the, the cloud uh, infrastructure issue is something we, we have to solve separately. And I have some ideas about how to make it safe in the cloud. And then, yeah, then, then we work on the OERs in there and the trust in it and we can do a lot of things. But uh, yeah, that's making sense to not pile it all into the local device. Because if the, if the local AI is... Um, minimal, it'll run on more devices, which helps the equity issue too, because it can run on watches and, you know, phone, all sorts of phones and probably fridges and things. Okay, uh, I'm going to jump to another topic before the end. Um, sorry? Oh, there is? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, good. No, I'd, I'd love, I think we'd love to hear from you, Fred. Uh, yeah, let's do it now. Let's do it now. Come and show us something. Do you want to use your laptop, plug it in? Yeah, great, great.
I think Martin deserves a bit of recognition for four days and probably five hours of sleep. You know, it's still passionately pushing forward this vision of how open educational technologies can just make the world a better place. And I think you guys probably picked up that AI is both an enabler and an opportunity for us to get further along this vision. And if we don't come up with ways that we can use AI responsibly for the purpose of lifelong learning, others are gonna do it. And they'll probably be more corporate and probably less responsible. So just a rant for a second, when you talked about open ed tech and you know, all the things we wanna do, there's a part of here, like there's a brand of open ed tech. And I think of like the Red or whatever, Project Red or whatever. Like maybe we get to a place where we're not having to build everything, but we, we vet other things and people trust this brand, they trust the sources and they trust the people behind it. And organizations may want that trust from us. And if they do, well, they have to meet these criteria and then it just sort of grows over time. So there's value in what we're doing, but there's also maybe value in the brand that we're building as well. Okay, so uh, in the context of a personal assistant, I'm gonna put this down for a sec. All right, I'm gonna do the one-handed thing as well here now. So um, you guys know me, uh, Big Blue Button, been working on this for 14 years, really passionate about building like the world's most effective virtual classroom for learning outcomes. And one thing that we've been looking at is uh, AI as well. So in the context of like helping a teacher, how could AI help a teacher more effectively engage with students? So imagine you're in a class and you want help. You want help to just save you time so you can spend more time interacting with students, the human part of it, right? Which is what a virtual class can provide, the human interaction. So one thing we know that is if you as teacher upload slides, you're gonna talk about content, so I've got something here I found on the internet about Rome, and at some point you wanna say, are students getting this? Are they following what I'm doing? And a very powerful way is to do a poll. So I could start up a poll and start like, okay, typing one-handed into it and say, oh, can I do a poll? But the text is already there, and we read it into memory with screen readers, so uh, four screen readers, so we basically used open AIs, API, which could be like Llama 2, or it could run the model locally, I mean, I think this is where we're getting to. And I could say, well, uh, I wanna generate a poll question, you know, based on the content of the slide. So it grabs the content, sends it out to OpenAI with a prompt that says you're a teacher, and it comes back with a slide, uh, with a poll question. Now one of these should be correct. In fact, the one that's bolding is correct. And so if I don't like that one, I could regenerate it. And the idea would be is instead of me typing something up and trying to remember it, I vet what it came back with, and then at some point, I uh, will just basically just do the poll. So let's say I accept the poll, and I get to change a little bit here, and if I start it, then on my screen here, it's a very big poll. Uh, I could just press one of them, and it should come back, but there's one choice. And then at the end, uh, I won't try to publish this one because I think it would dominate the screen, but that's an example of AI assisting the teacher uh, to more effectively engage students online. Thanks, Fred. That's good. Uh, so glad to have your voice up here too uh, today. Um, look, I think we're really at the end anyway. Um, what? No, no, I think I, I'd hard to even get into another discussion. We're a couple of minutes from the end and we should, you know, geez, they're really, they're really strict with the meals here, so I want to make sure yeah, everyone gets the meals. I really ap apologise about that. It's not our fault. It's the way the hotel catering works. They're very like... <laughs> Um, so we, we just have to work with that and keep to time. Um, but maybe some, you know, general um, uh, feedback or topics. I mean, has this been useful for you, help you think about these issues? As, uh, I'm seeing some nodding, I'm, I'm, I'm glad for that. Um, these are the, you know, our role um, as education technologists, which we all are in some way, is to plan the future of education technology. Not just use it as it is today, where the world is looking to Moodle, to open ed tech, to all of us, 
in our, you know, you're all experts in your own organizations. They're looking to you to help tell them and guide them. So we're all here to guide each other and this is the, the association uh, the, where we can work that out for ourselves so we can help the others. So um, I'm glad we we're able to have this in person today. But remember, there are a lot of things happening online. Um, the, the chat can be either very quiet or very chaotic because it's a chat. <laughs> it's maybe not always easy to follow. Um, as we get a little bit more time to have more administration going on, I really want to explore how we can do this, these sort of working groups, thinking and planning, brainstorming, designing synchronously. We use big blue button in our meetings and also asynchronously through the documents and um, chats and, and then also just keeping in touch with developments through Mastodon. Uh, you know, make sure you get into Mastodon, follow Open Ed Tech, follow other people. If you want, if you want an account on our server, just uh, sign up if you haven't already and, and drop us a, a note and we'll create an account for you. It's not, uh, actually no, you can go to openedtech.social and apply for an account but we're only accepting accounts from people we know. <laughs> you know I, wish, I wish I could just give it to everyone, but they, that server already costs us quite a bit. So, great. Uh, yes, and Dan, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, thank you for facilitating. I think it's been really fascinating, and I love this approach instead of passive listening, which is great, but this is great as well. I think it's worth mentioning there are already a couple of plugins on the Moodle plugin database, which are AI, um, focused. I'm just looking at them now. AI text to questions generator, AI chat block, there's an AI connector. I think there's even a, a text, to um, text to image generator as well. Indeed. So these things are out there yep. and being developed and, uh, you know, run one on a test site, see how it works and, and get using it. Well, totally. I mean, uh, that, but I'm not wearing my Moodle shirt today. I'm wearing my Open EdTech shirt. No, I appreciate that. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it, the Moodle community is developing most of the AI stuff around Moodle uh, at the moment. We, we are, there is that survey I pointed out yesterday where we want to find out more thoughts about Moodle specifically. Um, but, yeah, this is more about the, the, the longer range vision for how Moodle is part of a, a much bigger thing. And um, so... Thank you for being at the Open Ed Tech Workshop. We are finishing exactly on time, and it will return you to your regularly scheduled Moodle moot out the door. Thank you.